coming up tonight on The Bachelor. Oh, good morning. Uh, it's the morning. Good morning. This is Colton. And this is how Colton is most often depicted on television. Tonight on The Bachelor. Colton looks so hot. <laughs> How are you guys doing? I just want to know him in like the raw version of him. Colton is a bachelor on the TV show, The Bachelor. If you haven't watched it, don't. This is not a recommendation video. The Bachelor is a profoundly superficial display and presumably even its most committed fans know this and yet yeah, indulge in it anyway. So this makes it a compelling object for critical analysis. What? is going on here? And why do people continue to watch this after decades? As a cultural phenomenon, this definitely has something to say about the post-truth era we find ourselves in. There have been 25 total seasons of The Bachelor and Bachelorette, and millions of people still watch these and all the other spin-offs. However, as it turns out, the show is far more successful at producing uh, drama and Instagram celebrities rather than actual marriages. Despite the pressure and incentives of the show to get a couple engaged by the end of the season, it's like six weeks or something, it boasts a miserable sub 15% success rate at producing true love. But this video isn't really about The Bachelor, it's about this guy. If anyone, he's the prophet of post-truth, John Baudrillard. Although he probably doesn't look as good in the shower, uh, Baudrillard was a morose French cultural theorist obsessed with the eclipse of reality by the increasingly artificial mass of images in advertising, news, and entertainment. The disappearance of the principle of reality for him was a historical event. And though we can't be precisely sure when it happened, images like those of The Bachelor are in part responsible. So what does it mean to say that reality has disappeared? It's not a metaphysical claim so much as it is an epistemological one. Uh, one that changes the way we interpret reality from now on. Thanks to an endless wash of these coded images by media, entertainment, news, advertising, it's impossible to draw a distinction between real and copies anymore. In some cases, reality itself is modeled after copies rather than the other way around. Here's a quick example from advertising. Since we are discussing engagements, and all of you know this, diamonds are not naturally associated with either betrothal or marriage. Uh, this association was created almost out of the blue and relatively recently by one of the most successful marketing campaigns in history, which was bought and paid for by the De Beers Diamond Company in the 1930s. Hiring an ad agency, they pushed diamond rings into the cultural imaginary as the symbol of true love. A diamond is forever. And this was so successful that today engagements, for all intents and purposes, must be accompanied with a diamond ring. Seriously, I. How do you think that's gonna go if you walk into that with that one? The connection between marriage and diamonds is of course completely arbitrary. And before this advertising campaign had no basis in reality and it wasn't even the norm. But today, life imitates advertising. Life imitates advertising. Life imitates advertising. When our lives start copying these pure fabrications, we are in a situation that Baudrillard calls hyperreality. Remember this word because it's gonna define pretty much every step of Colton's journey to true love. The whole of The Bachelor traffics in heavily stereotyped simulacra. A simulacrum, as seen on the title of this book, is a copy of the original. But at first, we know it's a copy because we know what reality is. We have principles by which it can be determined. You know that a picture of you is not you. However, when you enter hyper-reality, you can't properly distinguish what is real from what is simulated anymore because everything participates in the process of simulation. If you 
pick her, you're not gonna see the full her like that. There's a fear of mine. The ultimate purpose of simulacra in this context is not to hide the truth, but rather conceal the fact that reality, or in this case, true love, was always already a construction. But we have to use excuses as to why we could believe in it, just as we could believe in any other cosmological causes, such as the providence of God, for example. Now, what does any of this have to do with reality TV? In a lot of ways, reality TV is more fictional than the fictional media as such, because it presents itself continuously as something real. And this is where The Bachelor comes in. It's a show about true love, or how true love presents itself. But it's demonstrably awful at achieving this goal. Since this all ended, Things have been different. Are you gonna end this tonight? I have to. Let's bring her out. This is not so much a question of real versus fake, but a question of real versus simulation. And the consequence in this case is that we unfortunately discover that true love was always already a fantasy to begin with. This is a show about simulated personalities in wholly simulated environments forming simulated relationships for the simulated dream of an amorphous abstraction called true love. Now, love itself is not fictional, and that's not what I'm saying. Uh, many people experience love. For many people, it is the best experience of their lives, and they spend the rest of their lives trying to produce those few little glimpses they've had of it. But transposing this image and this experience into a highly codified artificial environment means that viewers are watching the simulation of a particular image of love. And The Bachelor airs in many countries and languages and the symbolism of each is going to be highly dependent on the milieu in which uh, it appears. So according to Baudrillard, in the era of simulation, it is no longer a question of imitation, nor duplication, nor even parody. It is a question of substituting the signs for the real for the real. That is to say, an operation of deferring every real process via its operational double. Now, what's the difference between a simulacrum, like an image, and a simulation? Or we use the example of taking a picture of yourself. If you look at a picture of yourself, you know between the two which one's you. The distinction between reality and simulacrum here is maintained. However, simulation is a process in which the distinction between the real and the simulacrum disappears. Images are copied and then recopied and recopied until they gain significations of their own, significance that no longer references anything but themselves. For example, if you take a picture of yourself according to a socially defined formula to add to Instagram so as to show everyone what an interesting life you're leading, now you're participating in a codified cultural process. The image is now duplicating you just as much as it's duplicating all of the established codes that accompany selfies. Though the picture taking remains the same, the real no longer plays the primary role in this relation, as the picture is no longer meant to represent you. It's meant to signify you as something within a matrix of images. And this is why, I shit you not, there are instructional videos on how to take a good ass selfie. When it comes to mirror selfies, it's literally the same thing. It's all about learning to cheat your angles to make your body look the best way possible. Check it out. All right, so here for the booty hack, what you can see, like you can see I have like a pretty much regular sized booty. Not big, not huge, it's just kind of like regular and chilling. But I'm gonna show you how to make it look humongous. All you gotta do is pop your hip out to one direction, like, oh, <laughs> one direction, get it? Hey, Harry, okay, no. So you can see if you pop your hip out one direction, it literally doubles the size of your ass instantly, and if you kind of just tilt the camera down a little, boom, you got an Instagram booty for days. Ooh, ooh. ring, ring, hello, yes, Amber Rose, that's me. The Bachelor simulates what it calls true love as a process. It can't be considered a copy of true love or fake love because these both have a prevenient relationship with the reality that the simulation no longer references. If you think about it, true love takes years to develop, years of difficulty, commitment, effort that can only be seen in hindsight. 
The Bachelor simulation of true love takes six weeks with fancy bougie looking dates, no commitment, he's dating like 30 other people at the same time, and clearly no hindsight. The producers are planning Colton's dates for him, introducing needless drama, all the while pretending that this is not the game show that it is. For this illusion to hold, everyone has to pretend that this simulation is completely normal. They rarely reference the fact that it's a competition show, and they never reference the absurdity of the whole premise in the first place. So we can look at this in detail. Consider the environment of the show. It takes place in mansions and resorts, decked out with chandeliers, satin drapes, expensive furniture, and so on. The characters are shuttled around by limousines and luxury SUVs. Their uniforms are diamonds, sequins, designer gowns, perfectly fitted suits, and champagne flutes. All these signify wealth, even though virtually all the contestants and probably most of the viewers can never participate in this level of luxury. So it's notable that while these are symbols of wealth, they actually constitute what regular people believe rich people do, wear and drink. Why? Again, these are images recycled and stereotyped from other media about rich people. That's familiar. Uh, red carpet award shows, television shows, movies, advertising for luxury goods, and so on. This demonstrates something of a classist fantasy that is particular to this show. It's neither necessary nor warranted, but the confluence of images might be because The Bachelor's uh, earlier seasons, like one, two, and three, were specifically chosen based on wealth and status of The Bachelor. But now, as is the case with Colton, they are actually just recycled characters from previous seasons. As is typical in the hyperreal, the motif takes on a life signification of its own after it has outpaced and supplanted reality. Just like the diamond ring thing, which was fabricated out of nowhere by some admin, true love is for people who can afford it and everyone else is free to fantasize about it. The realm of the hyperreal is more real than real, whereby the models, images, and codes of the hyperreal come to influence thought and behavior. In other words, an individual in a postmodern world becomes merely an entity influenced by the experiences of entertainment, advertising, and news. In a hyperreal environment, experience made available by the play of images and simulacra whose reference to reality has disappeared such that what was understood as reality no longer means anything anymore. Now, I'll admit, I know less about The Bachelor than probably anyone who has watched it. Uh, however, everyone knows that it's manipulative, simulated, edited, and unreal. Yet, there's a purpose to this simulation, too. Um, it's intended to paradoxically restore our faith in the real outside of the simulation. In this case, the purpose of simulating true love is in a highly artificial, codified environment is to confirm the belief that true love does, in fact, exist. And this is the ultimate cultural function of fantasies in general, not just this one. Now, news, advertising, entertainment, social media, reality TV, politics are all today loaded with images that merely simulate other images, contexts, and processes such that images don't represent reality. Rather, they simulate reappropriated images of an already stereotyped reality. Today, we are fundamentally compelled to reproduce these matrices of images. We're compelled to participate, to choose our poison, uh, even if we know them to be fantasies. You take the blue pill. You take the blue pill. Blue pill. This is because there's really nothing else left to believe in. So we choose sides with sports teams, political parties, social movements. We identify with particular commodities and brands that express us. We publicly post assent to our various definitions of good and evil and right and wrong. These affirmations are, by and large, now merely the repetition of advertising slogans. This really is our metaphysical crisis. So before any of us get all high and mighty about the fact that we don't watch reality TV, 
Remember that the principles of hyperreality apply broadly to many other genres and social systems as well. I hope to do a few more analyses of phenomena like this in the future. So thank you if you are still with me. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for future content. You take the blue pill.